My name is Joan L. Comiges, and I'm a trainer for Glenwood Incorporated, located in Birmingham, Alabama. And I want to welcome you to this class on de-escalation. Here at Glenwood, we serve people in the community and in our residential facility who are struggling with autism, with mental illness, and other behavior management issues. I'm very excited to be sharing this information with you, and I'm really glad that you're taking time out of your busy day to listen to this class on de-escalation. In today's class, I'm going to cover with you the basics of crisis and de-escalation. What's the basic information? And you'll need to check back in. There's going to be some additional classes that will tie into this one that will all help it to make sense in the end. But today, let's get started on the basics of crisis and de-escalation. A crisis occurs when someone does not know how to cope with a situation. Therefore, it is important to remember that crises mean different things to different people. Our experiences in life and our coping skills often affect how um, we respond to what may or may not be a crisis situation. For example, if I've never learned how to change the tire on the car that I drive to work every day, and then I'm out in the country um, and I have a flat tire with no cell signal, that might be a crisis situation for me. Compare that situation to the trained mechanic who changes tires on a daily basis. They're out in the country, they have a flat tire. Chances are that will not register as a crisis to them. In this example, you can clearly see that a person's experience and their coping skills affect whether the same situation is a crisis or not. An example of a crisis that you might see in the classroom is a child who begins to feel stressed out and unsafe because their peers are picking on them. For the sake of this example, let's say that this student has an older sibling at home who tends to pick on them when they're in the home environment. That child has learned to escape into the closet when their sibling is picking on them. Well, in the school setting, this child chooses to dive under the desk or a table when their peers begin to pick on them because they're feeling anxious or scared. Now, not many adults are going to choose to dive under a table or a desk when they're feeling anxious or scared, so we might not understand why the child feels the need to go under the table or the desk we have to look at it from the child's perspective. And in his mind, getting under something makes sense and restores to him a sense of safety and security. This child's experiences and coping skills cause him to react differently than an adult might react. To the child, it is a crisis, but not so with an adult. So, my first point is this. A crisis situation for one person may not be a crisis situation for another person. A crisis situation for a student may not register as a crisis situation for you. Therefore, if we want to de-escalate the situation, the needs of the person in crisis become the priority. Think of crisis as a bell curve event. A situation may go from calm, cool, and collected to an increase in energy and movement up the curve. At the height of the bell curve will be acting out and then a natural de-escalation will occur. Sometimes we may say something to a student and then the student escalates or sometimes we may walk into a situation that's already escalated to the point of yelling or pushing or throwing things. In these moments it may feel like crisis will never end but I want to assure you it will. People in crisis can't maintain that high level of energy for an extended period of time. The mind and the body will begin to fatigue and de-escalation will occur naturally. Now, even though that natural de-escalation will come, if we stand back and wait for that to occur, someone could be seriously injured. Therefore, we usually need to step in to bring about de-escalation. So another point I want you to get is this. 
A crisis situation is always going to de-escalate. We just want to recognize a crisis situation and step in to bring about de-escalation at the earliest possible moment. Another area that I want to focus on is how emotions impact behavior. So let's take a few minutes to remind ourselves how emotions impact behavior. Within even a 24-hour period, a person may experience numerous emotions that affect how they relate to the world around them. For today's discussion, I want to focus on sadness, anger, and hopelessness because these emotions impact students and teachers all the time and they can be a catalyst for crisis. I want you to personalize this for a minute. Think about a time when you have been sad. How did feeling sad impact your behaviors? Or what about the last time you were really angry with somebody? Can you remember how you were behaving in those moments? And then I want you to really think about the last time you or someone you knew was experiencing hopelessness. What behaviors came along with that sense of hopelessness? Feeling sad can lead to behaviors such as withdrawal, crying. Feeling angry can lead to yelling, cursing, blaming others, and a desire for retaliation. And feeling hopeless can lead to sleeping a lot, a lack of motivation, and a resistance to suggestions. As you think back to those times in your life when you felt sad, angry, or hopeless, can you remember having some of those behavioral responses? Someone looking at you in, the, in those moments without knowing your circumstances might label your behaviors as aggressive. In your mind at that moment, are those behaviors negative for you? You may not think so because in the moment you're feeling justified to be acting the way that you're acting. You aren't focused on the consequences of your behaviors at all. If that is how we as more experienced adults behave at times, then we should expect some of the same and even worse behaviors from the students that we're focusing on in this, in this class on de-escalation. I think we forget this in the moment those students are cursing at us, throwing things at us, or, or resisting our suggestions. We have a better chance of responding in a supportive, caring manner when students begin to escalate if we remain aware of the common negative behavioral responses to various emotions. That brings me to another point that I want you to get. Negative experiences lead to negative emotions and thoughts that sometimes result in negative behaviors. I'll say that again. Negative experiences lead to negative emotions and thoughts that sometimes result in negative behaviors. A person's ability to overcome all that negativity depends on the level of chaos in their life, their coping skills, their support system, and their own sense of purpose. Okay, that is some basic information regarding crisis and de-escalation. And that's all I'm going to cover with you in this first little class on de-escalation. But join me next time. I will be talking about identifying triggers, identifying those signs of anxiety in these students, and beginning to understand the why behind their behavior. Thank you very much.